Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome again to the C3 Summers 2021. It's so great to see so many of you all here and really excited uh, to be talking to you here, uh, within the next hour around all things VC and entrepreneurship with my friend Magda from Borderton. We're super excited to be doing this. Uh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> which is so awesome. Um, we are actually just saying we've known each other, I think, for almost about two years and we still haven't met. So nearly once the lockdown is over, we need to uh, arrange coffee and finally meet. Um, but super excited to be talking to you all guys. Um, I do actually have one ask. The team that have put on this conference have done such an amazing job, Daniel and Chris. So if you just have five seconds, which you all do, uh, please just say a massive thank you in the chat. Um, you know, during the pandemic, putting on events like this really does bring the tech ecosystem together. And uh, there, there needs to be more one is super important. So thank you so much uh, to the team for putting this on. Um, quick background, my name is Oli. I'm Global Community Manager here at Antler. We are a global early stage fund investing in pre-seed companies and we can support them all the way up to Series C. Um, we're in 14 cities globally where we have offices. We've invested in about 250 portfolio companies and we're a team of 150. We invest in pretty much anything. So if you have an idea, uh, we would love to talk to you. And I was formerly head of community at Straight for Esprit, one of the top tier funds here in Europe. Um, so just to set the tone of the room, you're all very welcome. And it's great to see uh, 170 people here, which is awesome. What we're going to do is for the first 30 minutes, uh, Magda and I are going to have a chat. This is super casual, by the way. I hate those uh, for formal conferences. Uh, it's going to be super casual. We're going to have a chat around all things VC and entrepreneurship. And then for the next 20 or 30 minutes thereafter, we'll open up to Q&A. So if you have any questions during the conversation, uh, feel free to put them in the chat uh, section on your screen. If you have a bit more of a personal question, which you'd like to ask Magda, feel free to send me a Twitter DM. And uh, of course, I'd be very happy to put the question to Magda uh, without disclosing your name. So, hey, Magda, so excited to be talking. Um, let's begin. I'd love to find your story. What's got you so inspired to enter the world of VC? Well, there is a, a, it's, a, it's, been a, it's been a long journey and it hasn't always been entirely clear. Um, but uh, I'm going to take a, a couple of minutes to, to answer this question properly, because it's a question that a lot of people close to me are asking me and a lot of people that want to get to, EC, to VC are, uh, are asking too. Um, and um, VC is, is a type of uh, industry that it's super, super competitive. So it's, it, it, it tends to be hard to get in. And many people are asking, like, okay, so how, do you, how do I get the job uh, in VC? And most of the jobs, they don't even, um, uh, they don't even get, get announced. So it's usually a, a headhunter story, which actually was the case um, in my case too. Um, but uh, but you can see it in two days. You can see uh, like uh, young women that have worked for Goldman Sachs that got headhunted head to VC, or you can go a little bit deeper and think back like what actually led up to that that time. And my journey into VC it started ten years, and I'm relatively young <laughs> before uh, before I I joined a VC fund, um, and it was actually already in high school um, that uh, three guys that were dropouts from Stockholm School of Economics, um, so basically student entrepreneurs, um, which I guess some of you are or want to become, um, they looked for interns to their like 30, 40 people startup. And that startup uh, was Klarna, um, and uh, it had a different name than the Creditor, but uh, but it, it was the same company. And uh, I did my internship there and uh, started working there part time um, in the evenings after school um, or when I was free from school. Uh, I I would go there and and work and do basically anything that a relatively junior person does with his first office job. So it was anything from market research um, to the less glamorous but very important part of the business which is working with people that struggled to pay um and um, and it was such an you know on one hand it was a little bit of luck that she managed to get into this type of company relatively early on uh, but 
on the other hand, if you it, 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 that environment, it's it can really affect someone early if you are in a place uh, that is and you're surrounded by super ambitious people, and that's your and especially at an age where you're very very sensitive to your surroundings and what happens to you. Um, I think it's 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 really really important. So it sort of sparked something with me. I thought like, okay, if these guys can do it, I can probably do something too. Um, and um, and later on, um, I left Jarn. I moved to a different city to study um, and became a student entrepreneur myself. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. Uh, so the company that I run didn't <laughs> didn't end up being particularly successful. But I think that type of experience it gives you a little bit of confidence um, early on that like you can actually do things and uh, and, and and get gets you really really inspired to to do something else. So I think from that moment I sort of knew that I either I wanted to create something myself or I wanted to help other people to. Uh, to, to to do it um and uh, and yeah after um after my studies i um i decided that uh, to to join uh, to join goldman sachs work there for a couple of years and then so, but sort of felt like there was a part of me that was that was missing um and uh, and i really felt that when i moved to vc i found that that missing part which was more about um people interactions and and the dreaming a little bit more because you're you're meeting with people that like they have a dream that they want to they want to do and um and and yeah it, it wasn't so easy to find that in an investment banking environment <laughs> so i leave it there um and 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 just to to say okay so what are the like really the learnings from from this story and like if i wouldn't be at Klarna, maybe my life would have taken a totally different path. And you guys that are listening to this, you will have similar opportunities, uh, but you just don't know it yet. In the same way that I didn't know um, that my internship at Klarna would become something else and would become such an important part of, of, of the things that, that I've done. And then the other thing is that you don't need to have any strong networks from your home or from your family. You just have to work a little harder, but you can do it. And um, you're unlikely to die of having to like balance studies at at work, but you are likely to miss out a little bit of fun stuff with your friends and and get the lower mark. And and I I think that's that's okay. I think what's so interesting what you just mentioned is you don't have to be super well connected to get into VC. So maybe um, you know let's have a casual chat around what are some of the top tips we can give to entrepreneurs who are trying to break into VC and exactly like what does even a VC do to their day to day uh, apart from talk to tons tons of people so maybe yeah. Like, yeah what was that moment um, how did you actually land the VC job do you, you mentioned you went through the recruiters what was maybe that process and what tips can we give to founders or aspiring students looking to get into the world of VC um yeah so uh, i think i was relatively i was ready when the opportunity came um and that sort of uh, i i think that is that is the most important thing because as, i mean some people uh, start in the opposite direction so they think about okay, okay so how can i get hold of someone that works in vc um maybe without having done so much research and, and thinking or without having the right experience. And um, and so I think it's it's really important to like fundamentally think about like things like what type of VC fund do you want to work for? Do you, are you more excited about the earlier stages or the later stages? Um, so I think doing a lot of a lot of research where you actually you don't, there is so much available online and there is so much like interesting talks with people that, that they're working to see blog posts, uh, articles. And so there is just so much that you can build up and sort of try to figure out a little bit of a thesis that about what you want to do. For example, I want to work for a smaller fund or a bigger fund um, that invests in, in certain type of stages. And then you have a little bit of a clear um at least an idea about 
what you what you would want to do and then you can start testing that idea with people close to you um and and the mistake that i think i did um in, in the beginning was that whenever i got an opportunity that was sort of a little bit it was close but it wasn't really exactly what i wanted to do i just said no or i didn't reply um to these uh to to, to these messages or i didn't interact and in the last um let's say six months before i actually joined a, a vc fund i tried to turn around these opportunities to um or, or these discussions to, to to something that could lead me somewhere so whenever someone asked me like okay would you would you consider this for example i said no i don't want to do this but what i would love to do is to work for a european venture fund that invests relatively early stage and at some point in the beginning it didn't give any it was there wasn't any difference but at some point you would have more and more people in your surroundings that, that knew what you wanted to do and whenever they heard of an opportunity they were like oh yeah didn't didn't magda say that that was something that she that she wanted to do so you sort of over time can help um get, get get help from friends or even uh, recruiters that are maybe trying to 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 get you to to do something else if you're just confident enough to say what you actually want to do That's great advice and i think for anyone um looking to enter the world of entrepreneurship um it's although it's difficult it's fairly easy now to start getting an understanding of the knowledge uh and you know what you could particularly focus on maybe to give some extra tips um really like have a passion for a particular topic or set or sector area similar to what magda mentioned the, the thesis so like for me for example i absolutely love the creator and passion economy um uh, before i got into the world of vc i didn't know any vcs at all but i've always uh i always love speaking to people so I reached out to five or six other VCs who are interested in the creative economy. Um, I, again, I wasn't in VC, but you start talking to them, start building an understanding of the space. They start introducing you to VCs. And I developed a community of VCs. Initially, it was just 20 people, and now it's about 500 in the space of 15 months. So I think if you can think a, bit, a little bit differently um, on how you can enter the world of VC and also go the extra mile, I think VC is all very much about being really good at, uh, with people interactions. You also got to be maybe good at the analytics or the finance side if you're uh, an, ana an analyst or associate. But it really is about identifying new trends and uh, being great with people. There is also a really good community called Gen Z VC. Um, it's not my community for uh, clarification, but it's for aspiring VCs for people like you guys in, in the audience. If you're interested in joining, uh, send me a Twitter DM and I'd be very happy to add you to the uh, to the community. These are really interesting insights about being a VC. Let's maybe talk about being a founder. Um, what does it take to become a founder? And that whole question, what if, why not? There are so many uh, people here in the audience today who have got that entrepreneurial idea, but they're just not quite sure if it's the right opportunity or not. So. What do you think and when is the right time to launch a new startup? And as VCs, how do we think about identifying new markets for these entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, it's uh, many questions, but um, so I, just to start with, I think regardless of like of, of who you are and what you want to do, you have to be brave. Um, and and you, you need to, and, and in one way or another, you need to find that um that confidence or that motivation to do something because it's a really really tough journey and you will get a lot of no's and there were probably times where you feel like giving up or just doing something else um and how we think about uh, about founders is that we don't care we don't care that much about when is the when is the right time because there are so many cases where uh where people have um launched successful businesses at very different stages of their life and also failed so there but there are different pros and cons for example if you're if you're a student founder you might um you will be younger you probably have less to risk um so you can naturally be a little bit braver um but on the con side you won't have as much experience um so there are there are 
many things that she will be doing for the first time. Um, so, uh, so these are just the, like the pros and cons of that journey, but maybe, uh, you know, you will be able to find a good support network or you will learn really, really quickly. You will make the mistakes and, you know, either you will be lucky enough that the first startup that you do will become successful or you will fail, but you will learn a lot of, uh, from, from, from the mistakes that you did and the next one that you do um, or the one after that um, will will become successful. So you have the benefit of, of launching something relatively early is that you have a lot of time. You can fail many times. You can do a lot of mistakes and you still you still have the, the, the time um, the time on your side. Um, and when it comes to like things that that we think um, at Volzerton and myself that like what really identifies a, a good founder, um, it's there is lots to say. But what we usually like to see is some sort of spike. So um, it can be intelligence. It can be the ability to hire well. Because as a founder, you also need to convince other people to join your very tiny startup with a crazy idea while they might have um, other very good opportunities. Um, and then, of course, drive and ambition. And it's usually the case that like one person doesn't have it all or doesn't have the spike on every single one of them and uh, and that's okay uh, but the ambition needs to be there uh, and that is purely because of how we as a fund operate we uh, we take other investors money that we're um that that we're investing and we want to create as as high returns as possible and that's not possible if you work with people that don't want to go there the whole way. Um. One of the things I loved uh, when we spoke yesterday uh, on Friday, dream big. Uh, founders have a big idea, but dream even bigger. When those dreams are starting to come into reality, starting to get a bit of traction, starting to get those spikes, the time is potentially to raise some capital. So when entrepreneurs come to you, um, what is the journey, the fundraising journey from start to finish? Um, when they come and see you, they have that informal conversation to uh, hopefully forward to no other VC funds mm -hmm. investing in that company. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so usually, um, so I would say it's a, uh, it's sort of a process. First, uh, the, the initial part, if if you are at the stage that you have a startup and and you need more capital to, to continue it, one, there are different type of investors for the different stages. So if you are extremely early, let's say you just have an idea um, and you haven't um, built a product yet or uh, or not even talk about uh, launching it, you might um, you might need some angel investors or some very, very early stage, early stage funds. And later on, as the journey continues, you go on to, let's say, yeah, a seed fund. And then you probably raise from maybe a Series A fund uh, like ourselves, and um, and later on you, you you basically raise from funds that are more uh, specialized on different stages. Some funds they invest across stages too. Um, so it's just to, um, uh, to to discuss the difference a little bit. And the different investors they will look for different proof points. Um, so for example, an angel investor can. Uh, might only want to back you and they will know that the idea that you have and the plans that you have they will probably change a little bit because at least I haven't seen any startup journey that ended up exactly as was written down in the business plan <laughs> it doesn't happen uh, but they will have the and because you haven't really proven anything you haven't done anything it will be very much based on you and your ability to convince them to um to, to give you to give you the money and as the the product and the, the commercial traction progress then there will be more focus from investors on uh on on the product and how how well it's um how well things are going, what the metrics are, how you acquire customers and, and things like that. But that is that is sort of a little bit 
later in the journey. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, and fr from our side, I mean, how how, how we operate as, as a fund is that first it's about like finding each other. So it's sort of a marketplace. Either uh, I hear or find founders that, uh, that I, uh, think are, are building something interesting and I reach out to them um, or they find me um, and uh, and reach out to me. So that's sort of, I would say, a, a relatively easy process. The things that are important there is to sort of focus on the right stage and the right type of, of, of investors. We always want to speak with founders really, really early because we want to build a relationship and follow their journey. It doesn't mean that we would invest in a company that doesn't have a product, for example, or, or it could, of course, happen in special circumstances, but that's not the, the core of our strategy. So I think it's important on both sides to have like, the right expectations for 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 the for the relationship and for the conversation. Uh, so one part is, of course, the like finding each other, and then um, it's uh, and then it's. I, I would say like even the first call is sort of a beginning of a due diligence process because on both sides, because you're trying to understand each other and trying to figure out if, if that's the right match or not. Um, and then um, depending on who the founder chooses or in some cases who the VC chooses, that's also, of course, goes from, from both sides. Um, you get to uh, hopefully get to a stage where you can where you can get a, a term sheet um, and 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 pick the, the best the best party for you and um, uh, and then um, hopefully you you sign it and after a while become become a part of the portfolio and that's sort of where the real work starts because then you have the money and now it's about uh, it's about it's about executing so actually a lot of um, a lot of our time is spent on on the existing companies and not only to to, to find new investment opportunities. And maybe something I think would be quite useful for the audience to understand is when you're starting to have those conversations with your entrepreneurs, what kinds of research or information are you scouting out behind the scenes? So you've had the conversation with the first mm -hmm. entrepreneur and then what's that process for you personally afterwards? Do you go into a massive deep dive in all the space, talk to 10 other companies in the same space, and then pick one or two entrepreneurs you might be interested in investing in? I think that'd be really useful just to go into for the yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah, um, so I would say it depends. There are two ways. It, in some cases, there might be a market that I know relatively well. Um, and in these cases, you sort of already know a little bit what you're looking for or you have at least an, an idea of, of what is what is interesting and, and not and then you can jump into a different level in the discussion and um, hear about um, how the founder is planning to do things because you sort of from an investor perspective you buy into uh, to the story about like what this will become and um, and one thing is to have the big dream and the ambition and you know wants to build the best company in the world but then it comes down to the questions okay so how are you actually going to do it and these are questions like okay so who will be your next hire who will be your most important hire um what if it's an early product like what what are the features that you're looking to build out in the product and this will say a lot about like where the focus is and where this product is 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 going um it will be about the market there is always some sort of competition in a, in the market there might be a more or less competitive markets um you can build um really good companies in both um, um but there has to be some sort of advantage so if you're operating in a highly competitive market or in, in a relatively competitive market i think it's really really important that the founder like really understands the market and understands the competition and and what they are doing well but also what they aren't doing well and why there is an opportunity and sort of has a strong thesis around where the market is going and where this company fits in into that future future uh, so that is something that i i personally put 
puts a, puts a lot of weight. Um, and and of course, um, of course, looking at like what has been achieved during which time period also is something that that we put puts a lot of weight on, um, and and the journey that that has been that has been so far. Especially, I would say, if the founder is uh, relatively young and maybe less experienced, then it sort of takes a little bit more to uh, to back um, such a person because then you will want to see that like fine this person maybe doesn't have as much experience and uh, but, but but has done a lot in a very short period of, of time so that is a way that you can like sort of compensate for for that or have been able to um, surround um herself or himself in with really strong um advisors or, or or people that are that are willing to help uh so proving that that you're a fast learner is something that that is something that that's that's really important to us and i think another point is um you know the entrepreneurial treadmill uh is really difficult and there are always lots of ups and downs when Balderton and the VCs think about investing in entrepreneurs, how do you have those conversations with the entrepreneurs when things aren't going uh, quite right? But also, how should founders manage investor relationships when they know there are problems inside their company? Because it will happen. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a lot about trust. Um, we are professional venture investors so we know that there is a even if we strongly believe in every single company that we invest in at the point of investment we know statistically that um, most of these companies they won't become um, uh, billion dollar companies so we want as many as, of them to 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 do it and we will do the best that we can to su support them on their journey but the reality is is a little bit different um so i think having uh, trust and a good relationship with um between investor and founder is really important and therefore i think being good with people is really important um if you are if you are an, an investor uh, to be able to to manage these these relationships um and 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 you know be able to to provide the the best possible support that that you can and um uh, and if things and that that's just the that's just the reality i think every single investor that has been investing for a longer period of time will have gone through the journey of one of their portfolio companies, for example, not making it, and um, and even even more than that. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's a it's a it's a part of the journey, and it's about like handling it in the most professional way uh, that is possible, and that still like creates the best outcome of the situation for for both parties. Um, but if you don't have the trust. Um, then, as a founder to to your investors, then you might not disclose as much information that maybe you feel that you should, and then it's also hard to get to to, to get the right support. And so, therefore, I think it's really really important to, as a founder to pick your pick your investors because you can go through like really good moments together, but um, but there will also be weaker moments and you want to work with people that you trust on both sides. And so if founders ever get to hopefully a really good position or getting term sheets from investors, apart from cash and being kind of that support bubble for the founder, yeah. what other resources and uh, you know, useful networks do VCs provide that allows entrepreneurs to go and hopefully blossom? Yeah, so it, it's different depending on VC. So I think you should definitely ask for it when you're raising when you're raising money. What like what will the actual support be, and what can you expect versus what you what you cannot expect. Um, at at Boulderton, founders of course get the support of the investment team, um, but uh, we also have built out a, a platform uh, that can help out with um, legal. Uh, finance, marketing, 
and um, something that is really important for startups, which is talent, uh, basically help to set the strategy for um, for for the org structure and for for who to recruit. And the other thing that I would encourage the founders to do when um, when you as a founder do DD on a fund, because you should do it, you should definitely do it, is to speak with other founders that have been backed by the fund the fund or the people that you're going to going to work with and uh, don't only speak to the ones that had a good journey uh, because these relationships will sort of uh, almost always be good but try to speak to someone that have raised from that fund um, and and failed that like that things didn't go exactly as planned because then you will really see the the true nature um of uh, of that so just a, a piece piece of advice it's such a good piece of advice and i think i think to always remember the founders the entrepreneurial journey is not a one or two year stint it's more of a 10 year stint and these uh, investors are going to be with you all along the way so definitely do your dd on them and actually also just spend as much time with them as possible they might not be investors yet get to know them formally but also informally and almost build a relationship with them where you can talk to them about pretty much anything if it's more for your business or on, on a personal level that's really important um just before we go into the q a if anyone has any questions feel free to start typing them in the chat and we'll be very happy to answer them but let's talk about some of the upcoming trends europe is such a hot space for tech right now and something we're so excited about what are your personal uh trends you are super interested in and what are some of the upcoming trends that might not be too popular yet, but you're super excited about? Uh, yeah, there is uh, there is lots going on in in Europe, and personally, like I don't think I've ever been so busy and so excited in my life about having like so many interesting um, founders and investment opportunities to 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 look at. I just wish I had more time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but something I'm personally uh, really excited about is sort of the shift to a more sustainable um, world, um, and and I think what we're seeing now is really is really just the beginning. So I think um, there are a couple of things that we need to do that we need to do better um, that. Um, uh, and a couple of, of, of ways to, to do things. So I think first we need to become better at um, understanding the impact of our decisions. Uh, so for example, uh, the food that we're eating, uh, where we're going, uh, what type of energy we're consuming and, um, and the way that um, for example, more um, of our energy usage is moving into our homes with electric vehicles, with the, like, sort of electrification um, of, um, of transportation and, and of, of, of our consumption. Um, and there needs to be more uh, infrastructure built around it because it's hard to make good decisions if you don't really have the data. And that is both on the B2B side, but also on the B2C side. And there, um, we recently invested in uh, in a company in an electricity company called Tibber. Um, if you're UK based, UK based, you probably won't know them um, because they are um, uh, operating in uh, Norway, Sweden, and uh, now Germany. Um, uh, but it's a next generation electricity company um, that uh, empowers the consumers to. Um, to, to to get in charge of their energy usage by um, helping them um, see when the prices are high and low uh, so you can manage your um, energy consumption when the prices are lower for example um, and it, it's a it's a it will be a huge challenge in the future when when we do um, when when more of the uh, we will use more electricity and we will also shift to use more renewable electricity and renewable um, energy is relatively volatile because uh, like if the wind is blowing and if the sun is shining you will have uh, you will you will have a lot and the prices will be low uh, but but if it doesn't the prices will be very high um, so we need to be able to be better smooth out our usage over the 24 hours that we have
Um, so that's something that I'm personally um, really, really excited about. Then I think we we should become uh, better at use uh, at use what we have. So sort of all aspects of the circular economy, in particular the the reuse space, um, both on the B two B side and, and the consumer side, and there at, at Bolton we've invested in a number of um, of marketplaces, for example, like the Steer Collective and and Depop, just to mention a few examples um and uh, and the third thing is to create new completely new ways of of doing things so like novel foods and uh, and, and novel materials and and that's an area where i'm i'm really excited about personally and uh, and looking for more opportunities in in, in that space and, awesome well we've spoken a little bit about uh in the past the creative economy what do you think about this space and is uh, Bulletin looking into this space much? Um, yes, I think it's uh, the, the, the trend is really, really exciting. And I think it's driven by a couple of things. Like in the past, you would only have um, true celebrities uh, that could monetize on, um, on, on, on the creating. Um, and I think that's mainly been driven because of the type of platforms that, or the, the power that these platforms uh, had and, and how the monetization um, has been driven a lot through ads or through, through collaborations, for example. And, and now um, we see more and more platforms. So sort of the platforms themselves become a little bit less relevant. Um, and um, and more uh, platforms are helping um, helping the creators to monetize even a smaller audience. Uh, so it doesn't have to be the case that you have like millions of um, uh, of followers, uh, but you can actually have a small and relatively tight community, but that are really interested in learning a skill, for example, and you can help them to learn learn something or to to share something with that community that they feel that they can't really find anywhere else and the ability to uh, to monetize on that is, is growing slower so i see like one trend with more communities be becoming more and more niche uh, so for example like platforms that uh, only do like um uh, makeup tutorials um or but also um also platforms that like enable uh people to tap into uh tap into the creators um in exchange for for paying for it basically yeah well anyone who's not quite sure about the creative economy is basically the underlying platforms that allow creators uh, or individuals like us to express our individuality so if you absolutely love makeup and you are really good at it you can um, start charging your super fans for teaching them how to do really good makeup. Um, I particularly became super interested in this space because uh, I've got a podcast show, which I launched about two years ago, and I became really frustrated. Why do podcasters not get paid uh, on streaming platform versus music artists who do? And it led me into this journey of really digging into the creator economy. I think what's so interesting now is there are 50 million creators worldwide. 2 million creators use their individuality as a full-time job, and there are 48 million uh, uh, creators who do this as a side hustle. I think one of the really interesting trends at the moment is, one, the audio space. So we've seen the likes of Clubhouse, um, where we've got more time on our hands and we want to get closer to the people we absolutely love. So audio platforms, I think, are really interesting. It wouldn't surprise me if the likes of uh, Bumble, LinkedIn, um, you know, will they start entering a space? Audio dating, I think there's probably an opportunity. Um, I think audio entertainment is potentially interesting space. Clubhouse for kids, I think could be quite interesting. I think it could be chaos, but I, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there. Um, so yes, if anyone's looking into the creative economy or any of the economy uh, trends Magda mentioned, uh, let's definitely connect. We would uh, definitely love to speak to you. Um, well, yes, before we go into Q&A then, the top tip piece of advice you would give to aspiring founders or VCs, what would Magda tell herself if she was starting all over again? <laughs> oh, it's a tricky one because it will be different for, for founders and for VCs, but regardless, I think like uh, 
uh, really like dream big um don't uh, don't let any like uh, other people uh, stop you i've seen like the most incredible uh, people journeys um in 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 my life or, or people people close to me um and uh, and yeah for founders i think it's uh, ambition and 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 the and do something in, in a good market that that really really helps um and for for aspiring vcs i think there is actually one thing that i want to say is that you you don't have to become a vc straight away there are so many different paths to vc and if you can get a VC job straight out of uni, that's great. It will help you a lot of, it will give you a lot of opportunities and it will, you will build a great network and a great platform to be able to also do something else later on. Uh, but if you don't focus on building a skill, um, something that you, uh, that, 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 that you will know about, and so I would actually say to don't think about VC and focus about focus on on, on learning something or, or or going through a different type of journey that you can later in life bring into the world of VC and be and support founders with that um, because I I think the challenge we see is that like you're you're expected to to be a, a, a really strong support to founders and it's hard to do it without any experience um of course uh, there are like there there are different paths uh, paths to it and uh, and there there are a lot of great investors that went from uh went into investing straight away but it doesn't have to be the case and i think maybe to also add there are always opportunities out there be careful of which opportunity to choose and secondly just always keep in touch with people as you never know what opportunities that might lead to there are 164 people on this uh at this event now find ways of collaborating find ways of learning from each other as although it not might be useful short term long term hopefully one or two of those people might be beneficial but cool let's get into the q a uh, some great questions coming in um, kind of back to the VC side of things, mm -hmm. how do you go on sourcing deals, looking at deals and tracking types of companies? Mm -hmm. What platform do you use? Um, yeah, so I think, um, so there are two, two ways to it. Um, one part is, um, uh, is when, when I am trying to, to find, find companies and, um, and I would say if the if the startup have um, raised um, any capital in the past, it's relatively easy because it becomes very visible. Um, so uh, so it's it's not um, it's not super hard to to go on uh, PitchBook or on Crunchbase or, or or see what is going on on LinkedIn and on, uh, and Twitter um, because these type of announcements get um, get relatively public so i would say like that is sort of the easy part the harder part is to um to, to get to speak to the founders uh before that and we source a lot through through our networks it can also be uh, founders that um that have um, that have been backed um by Boldeton in the past that can send a subtle hint to us sometimes that like this company is really interesting. Um, you should you should check them out. Also, um, other investors are exchanging thoughts with each other quite a lot, um, especially between like earlier and later stage investors, where there is very little competition. Um, so, uh, a later stage investor might set, might share a hint about an an interesting company. Um, uh, that that they have seen that is maybe too early for them and reversed, um, and and of course having relationships with with other investors because if if someone have already raised from a fund then um, the fund will also support in that fundraising journey and one of uh, one of the ways that they support is sort of to uh, to to help with introductions to. To, to other investors, um, and the other the other part is 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 for when, when founders are basically uh, reaching out cold, they send us uh, send us an email. Um, here, I think it's important to send the right uh, message to the right person. 
um, because it sort of has to be relevant um, on on both sides. And writing a, a short email with a short intro about that to do um, why how far you are on that journey. Have you launched? Have you not launched? Like where where are you stage wise? Um, and and what what VCs can help with? Are, are you looking to to connect and build a relationship, or are you racing? And if so, how much? Um, and uh, and and yeah. Um, and we we always reply to to the, the, these emails. It might take a little bit longer, but we we reply to everything. Great tips, and I think also to add, um, keep the message really short and to the point. VCs look at 10 20 maybe even more pictures a day per person uh keep the message short and once you form the relationship with that particular investor definitely definitely keep in touch with them uh they want to know what you're doing but also it's a very good way for you to keep them posted on your progress so definitely do things like investor newsletters which is just really informal casual updates on how the business is going um is is normally what founders do so it's always uh Good to keep in touch. Yeah, and one thing to add in the um, in the newsletters, what I've seen some founders are doing, um, is to to add a few things that you need help with or that you're looking for, um, because many VCs are. It's our job to be well connected. That's that's what we that's what we get paid for, <laughs> or it's one of the things that we get paid for. Um, so um, so so you can also try to leverage these early relationships, and you will also see like who you know who is actually trying to help um and uh, who uh, who is not this is a good question actually that's just come in what are your quick filters for finding good companies uh the the, the super quick filters um uh, yeah it's actually a really good question um it's it's a lot about like is this idea and the market um uh, interesting um and and about founder I, I won't really know um before i have spoken to them um because of course if if the founder has had like two or three successful companies uh, of course that's that's something that you will know but um but but not for the for the first time founders um so that is something that you sort of uh, discover when you when you speak to them um and then I personally folk. I mean, because we have a little bit of a focus area, so I focus on sort of the right stage. If a company is uh, is way too early, um, and in combination, maybe a, a a market that is highly competitive that we would be um, unlikely to to invest in, um, I would probably not engage. Um, hmm. Unless, unless Great. there is, unless there is something very strong about about the case that that stands out, it's a totally different take. Um... Good tips. This is actually a follow-on question. Um, with the pandemic happened in the last year, and hopefully we're nearly out of it. How have investors been making investments online, and what is your thinking around this? Yeah, so I, I have to be honest. In the um, uh, when the pandemic came, we were a bit worried. Like, can we uh, can we back a founder that we have never met? Um, and I think that we have learned that we can. Um, and it's overall, I think it's been easier, much easier than we thought. There are a couple of things that are difficult. Um, one thing is the actual partner meeting. Um, we would normally always have a physical partner meeting when everyone sits in the same room. The founder presents. It sort of becomes a little bit of a discussion. You see people's facial expressions. Um, now it's more the case that like everyone is on mute, so you don't have these like natural reactions, um, which which can can create a little bit of a of a different feeling uh, sometimes. So I would say that is something that that is still that 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 is making it tougher for founders. Um, but what's making it easier for founders is to get access to investors because we don't have to travel. We have more time to meet with founders rather than being stuck on airports or on flights or or in between meetings. So the intensity have definitely have definitely increased. Um, what helps is that if you have built a relationship in the past, maybe we have met at some point in the past, then it gives us enough comfort to to still do investments. 
And even if we haven't met, we've not, we've, we've invested in a number of companies where we haven't met the founders, um, or we meet the, we meet them afterwards. Um, and I, everyone is, is okay with it. Um, but I would say there are, um, there are some founders that I think get a little bit disadvantaged. I think if you have a very, if you're very, um, like easygoing and, um, and straightforward, uh, I think it's easy to build a relationship on Zoom. Um, but um, if you are maybe a little bit, if you're the type of person that takes a little bit longer to get to know you, um, it's harder to build that relationship over Zoom because a Zoom meeting becomes naturally uh, more transactional. Um, so I think there there is a type of founder that I think has a, a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, Great tips. And maybe just for the founders as well, when you're building relationships and the original VC says no, don't go and email the same VC fund, but a different individual in the space. We all keep track of who we've spoken to. We've all got VC CRM systems. Just keep in touch with the same person you kept in touch with. I see entrepreneurs do this and it, it actually damages your relationship with the, with the VC, not the other way around. Um, so I think just maybe bear that in mind going forward, but this has been super exciting. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Maybe just to ask you one last question, maybe more of a personal question. We have spoken about dreaming big and dreaming big and bigger. So what is Magda's long-term plan and would you ever go back to being a founder? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> right now I think um, I'm, I'm happy in BC. So uh, my my big dream is to find uh, um, really, really interesting startups um, and uh, and help them to, to to go through the journey. That is what gives me gives me more 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 satisfaction, um, at least at work. Um, on on the personal side, I spe- I love spending time with uh, with nature and uh, uh, and animals. Uh, they never ask about any due diligence or market analysis. Um, really enjoy horse riding. So, um, what has really helped me on the personal side is to to be able to after like a day where I spent like 80 to 90% in front of the screen to be able to actually like go out in the nature and um, maybe do some some horse riding um, and to, to sort of like to, to clear your mind. I think it's really important to have something like that in your life. 100%. So if there are any founders that are there building the next big thing, where can they reach you? They can reach me on email. Um, I'm trying to be as accessible as possible. So magda at boldertown.com simple well thank you so much everyone to the audience let's all keep in touch with each other have a great rest of the afternoon and we'll see you soon thanks so much Magda. thank you bye